Hi, I'm Mike Maloney, and welcome to another CSRM podcast. Today's episode is hosted by Dr. Greg Glenville. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another CSRM podcast. I'm Dan Stover, joined by Scott Stedman and also Dr. Greg Linville, and uh, we are continuing the conversation from the book called Scent, The Missiology for the Sports Outreach Community. And uh, just so you know, our heart, if this is the first time you come across the CSRM podcast, our heart is to simply equip you. Uh, we're all about relationships and resources, and so you're probably wondering, okay, is this a, a book review? Do I need to purchase this book? What's the point of all this? Well, we just want to encourage you, yes, buy the book, and you can do so through our website, csrm.org. Just click on the store online store tab, and uh, you'll be able to purchase books right there. But also, we want to encourage you, these books are great for conversation starters. In fact, the books are designed in such a way, at the very beginning, there's an outline of each chapter, and you can find the exact page number that each topic is listed at. And so if you are, if you're in sports ministry, if you do sports rec and fitness, grab a book, use this podcast, grab one of your elders, your senior minister, grab some of your volunteers, what we call local church miss, uh, missionaries, grab them and listen to this podcast and have some conversations. So again, this is for you to help to equip you with a resource to allow those relationships that are under your care to thrive in ministry. So uh, with that said, Dr. Greg, we kind of teased chapter three during our last episode. And so I think you you quoted uh, D.L. Moody, and then we kind of uh, began that conversation. So pick up where we left off last time. Let's dive into chapter three. Well, great to be with you guys again. And hello to everybody out there that's listening and watching. And yeah, um, let's reset some of the rationale for the book. And that is that as far as the best research that we can find, there's some 5 billion people who currently exist who will not spend eternity with Jesus unless someone is sent, unless someone goes. And, and so that's, that's the basic bottom line. And what's amazing to me, Scott and Dan, it, it, and we had some even preliminary conversation as we were setting up recording this, that our denominations particularly, but even some local churches are embroiled in all kinds of theological pragmatics discussions of that center around gender, cent center around uh, global warming, center around is it capitalism or socialism or I, I mean, it, it it is the the mode of baptism. We we are we we're not satisfied that we are baptizing people. We're we're debating about whether we use water or not, or what how how much water and how's that water applied. And and it's not that these things are not important, but they are taking precedence over sending people so those five billion people can have eternity with Jesus. And, and that's what's amazing to me about this. And if all of these dire things are, are out there, that the world is going to come to an end because of the climate change, if, if, if all these wars, all, then all the more reason that the church needs to be centered and focused on, let's go reach these people. And how does that happen? By sending people. And so... Uh, I'll stop there and let you guys respond. But to me, that is the absolute reason for this book and a whole series of books and a reason for CSRM. Yeah, Greg, I, I think um, if you're listening to this and you're tied to a local church anywhere in the entire world, you probably felt called to that church. You felt called to that ministry. Um, maybe you felt called to get your education, your theological training, because you want to fulfill the Great Commission 
And then you're finding the awesome challenge of, of what it is to inspire others and to equip others to know, hey, Matthew 28 isn't just meant for me and my ministry. It's meant for you as a follower of Christ as well. And the multiplication and disciple making that can happen. So um, absolutely, I, I think that would that would uh, focus on a lot of different things in our world um, and provide some answers and provide some hope uh, as people hear about Jesus and as people uh, develop that biblical worldview because of our time with them. Yeah, it's it's our mandate and it's our motivation. At least it should be. Hmm. And, and you know the yeah. the idea here that that we we want to kind of harken back to a little bit is in the in the late 1800s early 1900s there was a, there was a movement called the student volunteer movement and Moody and others were the impetus behind that but i would hope that we would have a new outpouring of the holy spirit in this day and age more people were sent at that era than almost in any other time and could they have done it better sure can we learn from them yes and that's some of the stuff we'll talk about today but but the passion needs to be there and one of the things that I, i'm grateful for that there are congregations that are calling people into faith in Jesus. I mean, that's what we've kind of built this whole thing on, but sometimes almost to the exclusion of sending people. And we mm -hmm. need to get back to not just calling people to faith in Jesus, but then after they've come to Jesus, empowering them to go. How do we send them? And therefore the title of the book and therefore the everything that we're going to do. Now, I hope we get back to that passion of, of the student volunteer movement in our day and age. But can I encourage denominational church leaders? What are you doing to identify and then train and enable and empower and mobilize and end up sending people? All right, enough of that. It starts even with the word. Missiology starts with missio which says something that is sent. A missive is a letter. Uh, a, a missionary is someone who is sent. And so it all comes from that word sent. And here's, here's the thing. Right now, I can hear a lot of my sports ministry colleagues saying, all right, doc, put it in English, all this missio stuff. Or the, my academic cohorts, how, what's the research? What is this based on? Hey, look, you know what? I think it could come down to just simple, simply saying, let's not just talk about going, but let's talk about sending. That's a key distinction that this chapter and this book is making. And I'm going to ask you a couple uh, uh, questions and put some phraseology to this, and I'm sure Scott will start putting these words up for you, but pastor, are you feeding the flock rather than locating the lost? Are you mm. maintaining members or are you winning the wayward? And the Great Commission starts with that mentality that, yes, we, we need to take care of the people that are already there. But the reason that we bring them in is so that we can send them out. And so if we can locate the lost so that, that we can win the wayward, this is what we really want to be about. Your guys' reflections upon this. Yeah, I'd say, yeah, that's that's a great point because I feel like the, the mentality as of late has mostly been, well, I need to keep the people within my flock happy and healthy so that they are giving money or their ties or offerings to us so that we can go and do ministry at the same time if you're not challenging your people to go out then eventually you get to this trap where as your base gets older and they start passing away you're not bringing anyone else into the church and I think the same thing could be said about sports ministry. If you have a good core group of people on your team, 
And it's like, okay, well, I have a good core group. Well, then eventually they start moving away. They start having injuries and they can't play anymore. So they have to be like in a coaching position or they're just done. And then it's like, okay, what were you doing to kind of help bring more people to your to your uh, sports ministry event? And then you're now in a position where you're just trying to rebuild from the ground up again. I, I think you're spot on, um, Scott, and I think that applies to so many different ministries and mm-hmm. uh, just that that feel, that struggle, um, especially in the Western church. We're so program heavy. Um, so if you're running a sports ministry right now, if you're doing some fitness classes, you know all the effort it takes to run that class or that league or that camp. All the things that are on your plate to make sure the details are covered and then you've got these people that you want to care for and you want to make sure they have a good experience and that they'll come back and be a part of that. And so there's so much of that stuff. Or if you're a, a preacher, hey, Sunday comes every week. So there's another message <laughs> for you to prepare and organize a worship service. And then somebody dies. And so you have to do that funeral. And then there's somebody who wants to get married. And so you're doing some premarital counseling. Um, all good things. Uh, But so often we create, I think it's unintentionally, this culture where we do everything, everybody else kind of watches us, or they participate in our leagues. But when it comes to being sent, or even feeling like they're sent or equipped to be sent, um, it's just not there. So so Greg, I, I think the basis for this book, the theological foundation of the Great Commission is what we have to get back to. It's it's right there in the very words of Jesus. Absolutely. And what was Jesus doing in the Great Commission? Mm-hmm. He was sending. Yep. He wasn't going. He was sending. He was sending his disciples. And through them, he's sending you and I. And hopefully through us, we're sending all kinds of people. And so that's the real essence of all of this. And uh, another feature of this book is that we we highlight in all the chapters what we call the muscular Christianity pioneers or heroes. And there's there's these timeouts that we take a look at these people, and we've mentioned a couple of them already. But but what we n- need to have people understand today is what muscular Christianity actually means. Um, yeah, obviously it took on this ambiance of, hey, these people are strong. And so muscular uh, was that era's w- word for strength, and they were Christians. I I need to let people know that, that the muscular Christianity era, which was from about 1820 to about 1920, uh, roughly speaking, high, really high between 1880 and 1920, that that um, these people w- were different in different parts of the world. There are really kind of four different versions of that. We don't have time to go into all that, but so I can see some of my English brethren, Stuart Weir and others saying, well, that wasn't muscular Christianity here. And, and it, it, the muscular Christianity took on some different flavors or expressions around the world. But the one that a lot that is featured in this book are the people that were part of that evangelical Christian church. And they were really trying, in the quote from Moody that we had last time, go back and listen or watch to that, that podcast, mm-hmm. was about basically use whatever you have to go go and do it. And, and then he had the Northfield conferences where he actually sent out these people, these college students and older uh, in the student volunteer movement. And so we, we highlight this, but we need to understand this about muscular Christianity. It was an answer to a theological issue that the church had become fairly weak and the church was much more, and this is a loaded term these days, much more feminine in its orientation. Mm-hmm. And and I would, if I had time, I would explain that a little bit more. There's nothing wrong with being feminine. There's nothing wrong at all, except if it's exclusive 
of anything masculine. Uh, it needs both. And so the, the lacking part of masculinity and men being in the church, the muscular Christianity kind of rose up in that era. And so part of what we're going to do, even in our next segment, is going to be talking about this whole idea about missiology and where did it come from? And who were these people? And then why did the muscular Christianity movement or era, why did it no longer go forward? And the reason it didn't go forward, because it, to a large degree, lost this very thing that we're talking about, the sense of mission. Initially, it was sending people, and, and they were going. And then we lost that, that muscular Christianity lost that, and it faded away. And it wasn't then until the sports outreach era came, some 20 to 25 years after muscular Christianity had faded, that things really began to happen. So, yeah. And Greg, I, I think that's a that's a great example of an era in, in history where uh, people felt empowered. And that led to the rise of people like Dr. Billy Graham and um you know, the uh, the friends of ours like y YMCA and Youth for Christ and uh, Campus Crusade and things like that. And um, I think it's a good opportunity. We, we're just about out of time, um, but I, I think a great a kind of recap of all of this can be found on page 27. I just want to kind of call this out. Um, it's called The Practitioner's Perspective from our friend uh, Greg English, um, who just talked about how mission has its root in sending and calling. And I think it's a great reminder as to what we should be doing, sending and helping people to process their call. And then he, he gives this criteria as to if your ministry truly is something that we would be calling missional. And so he asks these questions. First, am I calling those of my congregation to become sports, recreation, and fitness uh, missionaries to our local community? Second, Am I resourcing, training, equipping, and mentoring those who are called for effective missionary endeavors? That's a great question. Third, am I sending these local missionaries into our community to reach those who are far from Jesus and our church? I think those are challenging questions for all of us who are leading ministries. Are we equipping? Are we helping people to process a call? Do they feel sent? because they should. That's a part of what it means to follow Christ. So that's about all the time we have for uh, today's episode. We'll continue the conversation next time. Again, I want to remind you, you can purchase this book sent through the CSRM website, csrm.org. And if we can help you uh, generate a roundtable where you live regionally, we would love to, to do that. So reach out to us as well. Uh, we can talk about what that could look like. So you, you can have conversations like this with people who are like-minded in your community. So again, thank you so very much, and we'll catch you next time. Take care. The CSRM Podcast is a production of CSRM and their production house, Overwhelming Victory. Dr. Greg Linville is the executive producer, and Scott Stedman is the associate producer and editor. To learn more about CSRM, visit csrm.org. For more information about Overwhelming Victory, visit overwhelmingvictory.org. The CSRM Podcast is the flagship member of the podcast network Overwhelming Victory Radio. For more information on Overwhelming Victory Radio or to listen to our partner podcasts, visit overwhelmingvictory.org backslash OV Radio. For CSRM Podcasts, I'm Mike Maloney. Have a blessed day.